Hey everybody, I'm your guide and this is the third video in a series of more than 150 entries where we'll look at the fascinating and often frightening monsters inscribed in our trusty monster manual. In each video we'll cover what's in the manual but also other interesting tidbits I've found in my travels. This companion series is meant to educate, entertain, and elevate your excursions into the more dangerous areas of the Forgotten Realms. Everywhere from the cemetery behind your local church to the nine hells and everywhere in between. And even some places much, much more interesting. So come, join me. Let's begin. Today we're covering angels. Angels, also known as Asimun, are celestials that hail from any of the upper planes. Upper planes meaning planes within the Great Wheel cosmology that are aligned with good creatures. A few examples would be places like Arcadia, Bitopia, Elysium, and the great Mount Celestia itself. Angels, as a whole, are powerful entities of light and goodness who serve as warriors and stewards of the divine powers, and are also traditional enemies of all manners of devils and fiends. While the more educated among us know that the term angels refers to a specific subset of divine beings, you'll commonly hear those on the material plane refer to any divine beings as angel. While almost all angels possess sublime looks and most of them have wings, beyond this there's actual great physical diversity among them. Angels are divided into two main groupings, warriors and celestial stewards. The warriors are called upon to fight for the good gods and to defend the borders of those deities' realms. In contrast though, the celestial stewards are the angels who act as the direct hands of the gods. Each one has a particular purpose to serve and the stewards are the form of angels we'll be covering today. Celestial stewards are generally separated into four different categories. From weakest to most powerful, you have the Light Asimun, Divas, Planetars, and Solars. We're going to hold off on the Light Asimuns today and just cover the Divas, Planetars, and Solars, and we'll start with the Divas. Divas are angels that act both as divine messengers or agents to the Material Plane, Shadowfell, and the Feywild, and the bulk of the celestial armies in the never-ending battles against darkness. They're separated into three different orders, the Astral Divas, the Monadic Divas, and the Movanic Divas. However, following the Second Sundering, it's not well known if these orders still remain. Anyways, divas will appear as human-like men or women of extraordinary beauty with two magnificent feathered wings protruding from their shoulders. Monadic and Movanic divas stand around six to six and a half feet tall, while the astral divas are a massive seven and a half feet tall. Their skin color will vary, with the astral divas being golden, the monadic divas dark-skinned, and the Movanic divas a milky white skin with silvery hair and eyes. Typically, divas are adverse to clothing as a rule, but when they're adhering to mortal customs, they'll probably wear a simple loincloth with perhaps other small bits of clothing as well. However, if a diva dies, all parts of their person, including their clothes, will completely vanish, so it's made it hard for researchers like yours truly to examine them closer than a cursory glance. In regards to personality, however, it's unsurprising to find out the divas as a whole share the goodness of personality you'll find in all the other angels we'll discuss today. They're strong-willed and fearless, and no diva would ever be caught negotiating with beings known to be evil. In regards to power, divas and indeed most if not all angels have quite similar powers, protections, and traits. It's believed that they're all immune to injury from mundane weapons and even minor magical ones as well. They're also typically either resistant or immune to a number of energy types including acid, cold, electricity, fire, petrification, and poison. On top of that, they're all able to see in low light and even complete darkness. They're generally capable of speaking the language of any creature they come across, even if they don't know it inherently. They don't require food, water, or sleep, and will not age and as such are essentially immortal, barring certain magics or magical weapons. However, even if they are destroyed, their souls just return to their home plane and take approximately 10 years to manifest a new corporeal form. Okay, so what I'll do is give a sort of cursory overview of each of the three types of divas in order of martial strength. Keep in mind that though the types differ in might and magical power, they're of equal political status and see no rivalry between the three. But that doesn't mean you would never find them bickering with one another from time to time. First up is the Movanic Diva. 
Movanic divas are the most privileged and worldly of the divas. As mentioned prior, they stand approximately six and a half feet tall, but there are particularly mighty examples who could grow much larger in size. Movanic divas are physically the weakest of the three, but the most numerous. Nevertheless, as I said prior, they're politically equal to the astral and monadic divas. You'll find the Movanic divas fighting as infantry in battles against the forces of darkness, and they do so with pride as a matter of fact. Also, it's said they have the privilege to travel between the prime material plane, the negative energy plane, and the positive energy plane at will to aid prominent followers of the good gods in times of great need. Movanic divas love battle, though not to the extent of the monadic divas. Reacting swiftly and never taken by surprise, they tend to dive into melee with firm grips on their flaming swords, fighting with skillful, rapid attacks. Up next we have the monadic divas. They're the most patient of the divas with a firm appreciation for balance. Monadic divas serve as stewards of the gods and oversee the elemental and the ethereal plane. Their long watches over the elemental and ethereal plane gives the monadic divas a nigh limitless patience and a deep appreciation for balance more than any other diva. They're also the most stoic by a long shot, however sometimes they do become bored with their watches and start to desire battle as a much needed and much enjoyed diversion. Each monadic diva wields a long, sturdy, magical metal rod or mace, which are actually much, much more effective against foes armored in metal or made of stone or other solid materials. Monadic divas love battle more than any other diva. They use their great strength much more than their agility or speed, unlike the Movanic brethren, and typically they'll attempt to charm their foes before rushing into battle with powerful swings of their maces. And last but not least are the astral divas. These especially tall divas, sitting at about seven and a half feet tall, have especially lithe and supple bodies, long wings, and move with grace and unearthly speed. There's actually a bit less to say about the astral divas, because being the strongest of the divas, they almost exclusively exist to battle fiends in the outer lower planes. They're also oftentimes sent to these other planes to rescue lost or stranded mortals of good alignment. Each astral diva wields a large mace-like weapon known as a celestial mace, and while they have no need for any treasure or wealth, it's not uncommon to find them carrying other useful items on their person. In combat, these beings are devastating. Striking with finesse, they attack with their maces or rods, and two blows from an astral diva could easily leave their target stunned senseless for a brief period or just utterly destroyed. So that covers the divas, at least in a cursory sense. Next up we're going to look at the planetars, and if you think the astral divas sound strong, just you wait. Planetars are, of course, another order of angels inhabiting the celestial planes. They're truly awesome beings in the very literal sense of the word. They're defenders of truth and avengers of the fallen righteous. They act as the weapons of the gods they serve and present a very tangible representation of their deity's might. They're the messengers of the gods and mighty generals of celestial armies. They're also known to help powerful mortals on missions of good, particularly those that involve battles with fiends. Planetars are the second most powerful celestials right behind solars, as long as you don't count the celestial paragons, which are a whole different matter entirely. Planetars usually appear as a handsome, powerful, muscular humanoid creature with opalescent emerald skin. They've got white feathered wings and stand between 8 and 9 feet tall, weighing in at about 500 pounds. That's not to say this is all planetars though. For example, the planetars in service to Saloon have flowing blue hair and pearly white skin. Planetars are all good aligned, at least the ones we're covering today. They give off a sense of strength and confidence and inspire goodness in others through the power of their deeds, not so much their words. Planetars are found on the slopes of Mount Celestia, on the pastoral fields of Bitopia, in the forests of the Beastlands, and on numerous other upper plains. As celestial stewards, planetars directly serve the good deities. One or a few serve as the right hand of minor deities, while larger numbers serve the major deities. They're only sent to other planes to aid the most powerful and faithful of their deity servants. Only the most perilous of missions are assigned to them, such as rescuing a mortal cleric from the grips of a pit fiend, or recovering a stolen artifact from the lair of an Arcanaloth. On such missions, they usually act alone as well. 
In combat, despite the vast array of magical powers that you'd find wielded by angels as a whole, planetars are much more likely to simply wade into melee with their powerful two-handed greatswords or bastard swords. These blades glow with radiant light and are engraved with the holy symbol of the deity they serve. It's actually said that only a planetar can wield these blades. Like mentioned before, planetars bear immunities to mundane and minor magical weapons. They also wield a slew of divine spells like the ability to create a barrier of magical blades around them or even raise the dead themselves. They can send waves of exhaustion over their enemies, charm large groups of monsters at the same time, call down columns of divine fire, or even transform themselves into nearly any creature or object they desire. Beyond this, they can see in pure darkness, see invisible creatures as they truly are, perceive hidden traps, evil auras, and even see well into the ultraviolet spectrum. They're able to fly dexterously through the air at great speeds and speak to any creature they choose, even telepathically. And on top of all this, if you somehow manage to destroy their body, their soul simply returns to their home plane and reforms over the course of 40 years. They're absolute forces to be reckoned with and can stand toe to toe with some of the strongest fiends of the lower planes, and they're not even the strongest amongst our entries today. So we finally arrived at the Solar. Solars are created from the ascendancy of planetars as a reward from the gods they serve. Solars are simply the most powerful of all the angels, and indeed of all the celestials as a whole, again barring the celestial paragons themselves. Solars are godlike in their glory and power. On the battlefield, the solar sword flies into the fray on its own, and a single arrow from a solar's bow can strike a target dead on contact. So great is the solar's celestial might that even demon princes shrink from their presence. Solars have a deep commanding voice. Its human-like body is simply a picture of perfection and grace. They've got large, gleaming wings of white or coppery gold and eyes the color of a radiant topaz. They stand approximately 9 or 10 feet tall, towering over your average humanoid and weigh in around 500 pounds. These beings are absolutely unmovable in their loyalty towards both their divine masters and their alignment, and are truly the epitome of devotion, honor, and purity. In combat, solars are overwhelmingly powerful, which is complemented by their magical angelic greatswords as well as composite longbows, or bows of the solars, that allow the solar to enchant any arrow as a slaying arrow when knocked. Their magical greatswords can hover in the air and fight by the will of the solar's mind alone, failing only if the solar itself is destroyed. On top of the devastating physical prowess, these beings are able to cast numerous divine and magical spells. They've got the ability to blind, stun, or kill with a single word, become invisible, trigger a massive earthquake, or indeed shape reality around their whims by granting wishes. They can commune directly with their deity, allow a mortal to survive in literally any environment for up to a hundred years, or even blind their foes just by simply looking at them. Solars also sometimes summon the aid of other celestial beings such as phoenixes, Kirin, and actual titans. They can also gate in planetars or divas in the heat of battle as well. They bear all the same immunities and resistances of other angels and are surrounded by the same protective aura of good. Furthermore, they can only be permanently harmed by magically evil attacks from the most epic of foes. I could go on and on stating the abilities these incredibly strong beings have, but I think you might understand already. You simply do not ever want to find yourself on the opposite side of the battlefield from a solar. You'd have to be a truly powerful being to even think you could contend with such might. Lucky for the fiends and devils though, it's said there's only 24 solars in existence in the entire multiverse. However, there could be more and we just haven't discovered them yet. So that covers the beings we mortals know as angels. There's obviously quite a bit more I could talk about in this entry, but there's only so much time, isn't there? For example, we didn't even touch on fallen angels or go into how angels are created, but either way, these beings are truly some of the strongest beings you'll find across the plains. They command so much power and strength that it's no wonder that only the strongest fiends or demon princes are willing to even consider opposing them. 
I myself can't hardly comprehend what it would take to down a planetar or solar, but then again, I don't think I'd ever find myself opposing one of them. These celestial agents are sent forth to look after you and I, and I, for one, am thankful. Alright everyone, that covers the angel's entry in our monster manual. Maybe we can dive deeper into each one of these in another entry down the road. This is another one of those entries where there's almost too much to go over, but after hearing all this, I hope you know the difference between the divas, planetars, and solars, and feel slightly more comfortable if you come across one. If you look at the page after the solar, you'll see the next entry is animated objects. I don't think this one will be quite as long as today's entry, but I haven't looked into it yet, so it might be quite a bit deeper than I expect. Anyway, subscribe if you want to keep up with the series. I'll see you in the next installment. This is your guide, signing out. Be safe, take care, and happy trails.